Wayne Dorban here for the bi-weekly NTP Seed webinar huddle that we hold here at our Northern Colorado headquarters in Loveland, Colorado, both live here at our site and also going out over the web to those of you that are watching. Enjoy what we have for you today. Hey everyone, welcome to the Economics and Actions webinars. And we are so excited today to have Shannon Welch with us and she's with the Pacific Northwest Fiber Shed, and we're going to have a great time and we're going to talk to her about all kinds of things fiber related, which as you guys know is a passion of mine. And before we do that, just like to say that again, two weeks from now, and I believe that's right, I'm looking over at Brian and Deb, sometimes we have three weeks, but on the first and third uh, Wednesdays of every month, we do a webinar and we're scheduled for two weeks from today. And so come back and visit us again then. Remember, all of these are replays, um, so you can go on our Nurse the Planet site and you can look at the, at the replays there of any of them that we've done. So we've been doing them now for a year and a half, plus we did a bunch earlier than that. So there's probably uh, maybe a hundred of them that you could watch um, if you'd like to look at different things. So make sure to take advantage of that. These are awesome. Always get little bits and pieces of information. and with. With that said, let me introduce Shannon. She's with us from Portland, Oregon today. Shannon, how are you doing? Good. Nice to be with you. Nice to have you. Um, and so we were talking about the weather earlier. We're not having real great weather here in northern Colorado. Um, tell us about your weather there today in Portland. Uh, our weather has been warm. We've been close to high 70s, low 80s, and pretty dry. Not near the normal spring we're used to. It's been pretty. It's been lovely, but things are dry. <laughs> and and are you worried? Are they talking about too dry? I mean, you know, yeah. southern south of you in California, they're still in the middle of a drought. Um, so are are they worried about it going to be too dry? Um, I recently visited a few farms where, especially one that was in Ellensburg, Washington. Um, they're concerned about how dry their pastures are already at this point, and we didn't have any snow really this year. It was very low for the runoff. So yeah, I think people are a little, um, a little nervous about that. Yeah. Well, we um, we were at the opposite situation here. I've lived in Colorado now for 25 years, and we've been having weather like we hear you have all the time. It's just been wet and rainy. I saw yesterday we had almost seven inches of rain for the month of May alone, and and that our record I think was something like you know three inches, so we're almost double that, and, and so we're we're wet here, just the opposite of you, um, and we have fiber animals by the way, and we're supposed to shear them next week, and it better the weather better change because it's going to need to dry up quite a bit for us to be able to do shearing the way we hoped. Um, I also want to state something for our audience. If you will, on your screen on the right, you can see a chat section. And if you would, anything you might have question-wise for Shannon, if you'd go over there and, and just put your questions in, I'll be watching that throughout the webinar here. And, and if you have questions you want to ask, you can just throw them out there. And I'll either ask them right away, or I'll ask them a little bit later. So with that said, let's just get right into it. Um, tell us just a little bit about yourself. Uh, your current business and sort of life situation, just just however you want to describe it. Okay, um, I live in Portland, Oregon, and I am an apparel designer as well as a textile designer. Um, in my passion for knits and knitting and felting, I do mostly hand work. Um, I wanted to source regionally because we do have a lot of fiber in Oregon, and in the process of um, doing that, I started following the fiber shed movement um, in California that Rebecca Burgess began. And I started to realize that our region needed something like that as well. We needed to build a community of um, fiber producers, users of fiber, um, farmers, and uh, I applied to the affiliate program and became the Pacific Northwest affiliate of the Fiber Shed project. Um, so currently I'm out visiting farms. Um, I visited dye gardens and kind of seeing where 
our clothes come from regionally and who's doing the work and what are the needs? So how long ago was it that you went through what you just described for the fiber shed? So how long have you been the affiliate there in Portland? Um, for about a year and a half. But I spent the last five years really delving into um, textile production. And I've worked at lots of different I've worked at Columbia Sportswear, I've worked for smaller designers and kind of seeing how production works and on all levels um, and then kind of using that knowledge um, started getting more interested into the farming and the, the producers of the actual fiber. So tell us a little more about your personal situation, family, you know, um, you're, are you urban Portland? Are you in the suburbs? And you talked about what you do in the fashion design area, and and sort of what led you even into that. So what 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 brought you into fashion design? Um, I have always I've always loved clothes. That's always been kind of an expression of mine. Um, but I took up. I was a um, I was a teacher, a Montessori teacher in Colorado, actually for. A while, and while I was doing that, I learned how to knit, and I became super interested in knitting. And I was teaching; I have a math background, um, and the knitting really kind of fed that math mind. And the more I started delving into that, um, I was home raising kids. I have a family, and um, once they were school age, I decided to pursue a degree in apparel design to learn more about the actual how clothes are made and how to design them. Um, and that kind of led me to what I'm doing now. And tell us a little bit about the fiber shed movement and how what was the genesis of that? We talked about the lady that founded it, but tell us a little more about that. Um, so it was founded by Rebecca. She the project began when she wanted to uh, create a wardrobe that used all parts of the wardrobe: the dye, the labor, um, and the fiber were all from within a 150 mile radius of her where she lived. So she wanted to keep the whole thing regional, and she spent a year doing that. And at the end of that year, all the farmers she had worked with and everyone who were part of the project really felt really passionate about starting this internationally and where communities um, work together to produce clothing, textiles, fiber um, in their region. And so kind of the core philosophy is the dye, the labor, it's done within the region and using um, organic, natural, regenerative processes um, like carbon farming and um, yeah, and, and so through that, it's just so how many how many different affiliates? You, you mentioned you're an affiliate for mm -hmm. your region. How many do you think there are around the world, around the country, and so on? It's growing. I mean, she has. Um, there are definitely probably five internationally, and I every time I check, there's more and more affiliates within the U.S. popping up all over. There's really probably 30. So, and all the fiber sheds really kind of help each other because they, we're all kind of have the same vision and the same goal, but um, we, we try to keep it you know, within our region. Mine's a 300 mile radius of Portland, Oregon. Um, so it's a large region and there's other little fiber sheds popping up and we all kind of work together. But that includes, if you go 300 miles, that includes Vancouver, Canada, right? I mean, that would be yeah, we go all the way up, mostly uh, Washington and Oregon kind of is my, which is exciting in that there's just there's so I'm realizing how much fiber is grown. And so if I I'm taking it sort of a layperson's perspective of it, but if you reach the ultimate goal for your area, people would be able to buy clothing that would have been 
sourced in its entirety from within a 150 mile radius of of where I'm at. If I'm the prior, I'd yeah. be able. To, and and so the whole process would have been done. The fiber itself, the dyes, the whatever you know, all of the production process, taking it from the fiber itself. We, you know, um, doing whatever the processing is to make it into a fabric, and then the fabric being produced into a garment. That would all happen in that that radius. Is that right? Yes, and there can be some choose up to 300 miles, and they try to keep it a, no more than that um, to 150 miles. So they kind of it depends what, but yeah, that's exactly what the goal would be. And, and of, so, oh, 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 go ahead. Sorry. Well, and also. Um, it the there's a vision for mills so that the mills within the region it's also the way the mills are set up so that they're sustainable and um, they deal with uh, all aspects of it would have sustainable regenerative processes and that was I was going to bring that up next. Is it isn't just the locality; it's the way that all those people in that process do what they do. So, right. all the way from the producer of the fiber, all the way up to the buyer or the retailer that would be running their business to be selling. Right. Definitely. And how how old is the movement? So when did she start it? So I think her original project started around 2010 is when she started that wardrobe um, project she did. Um, so yeah, I mean, about five years or so. So it's really young. So where if I went to the place where it's the most developed, one, where would that be? Somewhere in California, I'm assuming. California, yeah. <laughs> how far could I get a garment? Could I buy something that I've got on me? This is This is made in Norway, by the way, and it is a handmade sweater um, with um, some kind of wool. I don't know whether it's a locally produced in Norway where I bought it, but are, is, are they close at one of those places of being able to take something all the way through in the fiber shed model? Yep, definitely. And there are um, there are a few, you know, I, I knit sweaters that I use fiber from here and I hand knit them. So, you know, some designers are able to do it on those levels. But yes, they're definitely close to being able. We've definitely got holes. <laughs> There's areas that need. Um, we don't have a fine gauge fiber mill. There's certain things we're lacking, so it would limits what you could produce that way. But it is yes. There's it is it is happening. And would a bigger mill like Pendleton, which isn't too far from you, would be in your radius? Mm -hmm. um, would would they qualify? I don't know anything about them, but if they met all the sustainability sorts of guidelines that were set, maybe somebody that you'd want to recruit to be a part of the fiber shed movement yeah, in your area? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, and for example, I know, because I live with her, my wife, we, we grow alpacas on our property. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we believe they're grown pretty sustainably um, in the way that we grow them. We we shear them once a year, which we'll be doing next year. Um, we have that fiber. Some of it is can literally be hand spun by my wife, so we take it through a cleaning process to a certain extent um, and can do it ourselves. But most of it we send to a, a place that's we think pretty sustainable, less than your radius away. Actually, would be have to be the 300 mile because I think he's more than 150 miles, but he's within 300. He does his process, we get yarn back, and then my wife knits, um, actually my daughter knits, um, she weaves, and so, and they dye, so they use natural dyeing, so that, they would be producing, they would produce a garment that would fit, if, is that the, that would be a process, right, that would fit the fiber shed model. Okay. Yep, absolutely. Okay. But as I understand it, what you're also trying to do is create community. That's the other piece of it, right? So that people, there are people that enjoy one little bit at peace, and so they can all know how to work together. Is that, that right? And also there's limitations on a lot of the 
farms are smaller farms, and so the amount of fiber they have, at, you know, after shearing, um, it's tough to find mills that'll do a really small run or where you don't have to wait, or there's a long wait time, or um, there's some of those things that the farmers are having to maneuver. Um, and I've also, about the community part, I've also, re a lot of people seem, they're very passionate about what they're producing, and they, it's about, they would rather give the fiber um, to someone they've built relationships with to be processed, or, you know, it's, they have kind of a, it's pride in their work and their efforts, and a lot of them have brought up that relationships are very important to them and how they're, who's getting the fiber, how they're producing it. So we're trying to build a community of people who know, you know, what's out there, what's available, what are people looking for, and help each other kind of maneuver some of the hurdles of trying to do. So one last question about the fiber shed, and then I'm going to move into questions about, about you a little bit more, because our audience loves to hear those kinds of things. Um, is, and by the way, Ask questions, folks. Put them on the chat here, and I'll um, I'll I'll respond to them. I'll ask Shannon to respond to them. If um, if I was going to be um, looking for a fiber product, I think some people are a little bit surprised at how broad that term encompasses. Mm -hmm. So tell us what kinds of fibers that your movement is interested in. Give us give us the breadth of those. Yeah, so there's, there's animal fibers such as alpaca and sheep, uh, angora rabbits, goats, fiber producing animals, as well as plant based fibers. Um, there's been a lot of work, especially in the California fiber shed, with cotton um, and with hemp now being, you know, a relevant. Uh, products that people are going to be able to start farming. Hemp is one that there's a lot of interest in. Um, even the growing of dye, which isn't necessarily a fiber, but um, I visited a pretty amazing dye garden. So kind of the whole gamut of whatever can make a textile. Um, and there's a lot of plant-based fibers that also make textiles. So yeah, we're kind of any any fiber <laughs> that has the potential oh. to create. So bamboo, for example. Bamboo, yep. Yeah. Yeah. And we don't have them right here, but it could be silk, right? That would come right. from right. from insects. So I, I, sometimes yeah. people yeah. get a little too narrow when they think about fiber. That's why I wanted to sort of right. make sure. I, mean, mostly, I think mostly animal fibers with people. Yeah, definitely. And then I'm going to make an assumption, because I'm not sure it can be horribly or greatly sustainable. It probably doesn't include synthetics. No, but there's, there is, um, there's a lot of research on synthetics and processes of synthetics. We, we're kind of more focused on farming and, you know, um, but I think there's. I think it's interesting to see the potential of changing synthetics and ways to make it. You know, because they have a place, <laughs> they have a use. So yeah, I think and that's part of it too is research. You know, it's constantly there's always new processes and new, you know, and kind of keeping up with the science of how textiles and yeah. And is there? Is there a goal? One last question, then we're going to move to the personal ones. Is there a goal for a given area, so your area, Portland, to have a facility that your members can come and do things in at all? Sort of like there's a you, you would have a uh, pottery guild, for example, where a person wants to do pottery, but they can't afford to have a kiln. They don't have the space for it and so on. Is there any movement towards a commonality space that people could do a variety of activities, spinning, weaving, crocheting, knitting, whatever. Um, yeah, process. I mean, um, public education is a huge part of the fiber shed movement as well. And um, that is something a lot of local artists have uh, 
contacted me about having interests in something like that. So I think that is definitely something we foresee in the future, kind of a place where people can share workshops or can share even tools. And, you know, sometimes people want to create things they don't have access to or right. supplies to do it. And I'll ask this again at the end, but if somebody wants to learn more about the movement and even specifically about your location, Pacific Northwest Fibershed, how would they do that? What what should where should they go? What would be the resources they could? Um, we have a website. It's uh, Pacific Northwest Fibershed.com and there's slashes in between the <laughs> in between the name. Um, that has tons of information about what we're doing and we're just got the website up. So now we're gonna start, you know, creating a marketplace and doing public education and that'll be where we um, and there's also a link on there to the Fiber Shed, uh, Rebecca's page, that really goes in depth on the whole. Yeah. Awesome. So now let's get into some of those little personal questions. Um, by the way, none of these are surprises to Shannon. We gave them to her in advance, so I'm not going to hit her with something that she's just totally surprised by. Um, so what, the one I really like, this one, there's a couple of them that are just really fun, and this one is if it was a beautiful day on a Saturday when you were 15 years old. This gives people kind of a glimpse of you when you were a young lady. And it was just gorgeous and you didn't have any other responsibilities, nothing you had to be doing. What would we find you doing on a Saturday afternoon? Um, in the winter I was skiing almost every Saturday. Um, and then when it wasn't winter I, was, I did a lot of backpacking. So I always kind of, even at a young age, we got outdoors a lot. Um, I spent a lot of time outside. Um, and then that kind of mixed with on a Saturday, I might also go thrift store shopping with my friends to look for clothes. <laughs> so there was always a lot of clothes. Yeah. yeah, so those are kind of either two things I would have been. Yeah. And where was that? Where did you grow up? What part of the country? I grew up in Portland, Oregon. Um, I was born in Colorado, in Fort Collins, and briefly lived in Wyoming, and then around, I think when I was school age, we moved to Eugene, Oregon. Um, and then in uh, elementary school, I moved to Portland, and I've been there pretty much ever since. Except for the well, you said you taught. You must have come back at one point. You said you taught Montessori in Fort Collins a little bit. so. Yeah, I taught actually in Evergreen at the Evergreen Montessori. Oh, okay. um, and I was a Montessori teacher in my past. <laughs> um, you don't look old enough to have done all this stuff, by the way. So, um, you, you know, on camera, they always say people look older, and you look so young. So you, you, uh, you, you, you don't look like you could have done all that history there. So now let's move it till today. Let's say you had that Saturday afternoon today. You've told us about you've got kids and you've got a you know, family situation. But, but let's just say you could do whatever you'd like to do again. It's just a fun, you don't have any other obligations for the afternoon. What would we find you doing? Um, hanging out at, with my kids. I mean, most a lot of weekends, sometimes just hanging out at home or going to the park and playing. Um, but. We kind of embrace weekends as a quiet kind of recharge, get to hang out with each other. And we do, I, you know, we try to get out as much as possible. That's one thing about living here. We have the ocean is only about an hour and a half away, and the gorge is about an hour away, and we have the mountains about an hour away, so, and the city. So, but yeah, spending time with the kids. Cool. What was one event you can remember from your youth that that caused you to sort of pursue the path that you're on now? You talked a little bit how on that Saturday afternoon you might be shopping, but is there any given event that you could think of that really, or you know, it maybe isn't a single day event, but something that occurred that, that had caused you to be in the fiber shed area? Now? Um, my both my parents grew up in farming families in North Dakota and I remember a lot of trips back there, a lot of time on the farm and was always kind of 
my whole childhood surrounded by farmers and the farm life and um, I think at this point in my life I'm embracing a little bit of those roots. Um, there's I have families important to me and um, I've always loved nature and being a part of it and I think that kind of goes back to some of those farm farm experiences. They're kind of, yeah. What do you, do you have anything you remember from going to that farm in North Dakota? Just a specific thing you can remember, bad or good? Um, there was always uh, lots of animals, like, you know, lots of pet like animals, and we always had a ton of fun in the hay. <laughs> the, the hay bales, little hours of fun in the hay bales. Awesome. Yeah. I grew up as a city kid, and but I lived real close to the country, and I had a lot of friends over in the country, and I could tell all kinds of stories about how those friends played tricks on me because of being the city kid. But I have one from my family, so a little bit like you. My parents grew up in Oklahoma area, and we would go to Oklahoma for trips, and I and it was a farm, I, so I'd go to my cousins, my uncle and aunt's farms, and that were all in the same area. Just a quick little one. One of my cousins convinced me that milk came from cows and ice cream came from bulls. <laughs> and there was a way that I could get the ice cream from the bull. And I'm not going to be real graphic here, but it would have been pretty dangerous if I would have tried it. And I was real close to trying it before my uncle caught on that my cousins were trying to create a mess. <laughs> so, um, so I won't ever forget that. <laughs> um, but we had some real good fun times too, different things. Um, so, what about in your youth still? Can you give me a person um, that really impacted you? Um, and, and it doesn't really matter and if whether it's a parent or, or somebody that was a teacher, you name it. Just, just tell us a little bit about that person. Yeah, I would have to say my parents. They've always been my biggest cheerleaders and the ones who really encourage and kind of push me to pursue the things I'm passionate about. And along the way, sometimes that's meant, you know, um, some sacrifices here and there. But, um, yeah, they've definitely have impacted kind of my pursuits. Cool. Um, you used this word earlier, so I'm going to throw this one out at you. You used the word sustainability. And since most of the people we interview are involved in some kind of green, sustainable, regenerative sort of approach, I always ask people what that word means to them. And you could also say regenerative because you use that term too, but mm -hmm. what does the word sustainable mean to you? I think for me it definitely goes to economic growth within a closed system. I think a big part of the fiber shed, the deeper mission, is um, the things to truly be sustainable in what I'm pursuing. Um, the economy around it has to be feeding each part of it, and we need to close those systems a little bit. Um, it also means through the processing of, however, textiles, um, that the biological systems can keep regenerating and thriving and kind of helping one another. Um, that would be, yeah. Well, I'm going to weave another, weave another little story in, and this is uh, something that I'm going to recommend to you to read if you haven't or to anybody else. A little later, I'm going to ask you about a book that you might be reading now or read, read recently that well, you would that you would recommend or that you really like, but I'm going to throw it out. Have you ever heard of a book called Eco Barons? I have not, no. So highly recommend it to all of our audience and to you. Um, and it's a, it's a compilation of stories about people who have had huge impacts in a positive way on the, um, on the world, on the planet. And the very first story is about a guy named Doug Tompkins. Does that name mean anything? No. Unfortunately. It didn't to me either. And, and I think I know quite a few names. And so, the, so I'll throw another a part of that story also involved another name called Yvonne Chouinard. Does that one mean? I have heard of it. That one might be more. Yeah. 
And what, do you know how you relate to Chenard's name, too? There's a company, by the way, that you'll recognize, that you know, people know. Yeah, I'm not sure. It's Patagonia. So, okay. Ron Chenard was the founder of Patagonia. Well, Chenard and Tompkins grew up together in San Francisco area and actually really spent time together in Yosemite as climbers. So they were rock climbers. And, and Chenard's about five or six years older than Tompkins. So Tompkins was like 14 and was climbing in Yosemite. And Chenard was like 19. Well, he seemed like a grown man, obviously, then to a 14-year-old. And over the, over the years, obviously, that, that age difference has become smaller and smaller. But here's an interesting fact about Tompkins. Um, he was the founder of two entities that everybody that's listening to this and that you will know about. And they were both involved in the fiber industry. And he actually was asked fairly recently about what he might do differently if he was founding those same two companies today. And one of the things he said was what I think embodies the fire shed movement, which is I would I would do things really different as it related to how I sourced products, how I develop them, and everything. So here's what he did, and maybe some of the audience, if anybody throws it in on the chat section, you know what Tompkins founded? Two companies that he founded. Anybody in the room know? Deb does probably, but you guys know. Well, he founded North Face. All right, and it's a retail store in San Francisco. And it wasn't the North Face we know of today. He did not develop the clothing line, all of the products that we think about that are North Face. Instead, he started an outdoor store that he called the North Face. And it was a retail store. And for his grand opening, he had this, this kind of hippie, offbeat little poet named Ginsburg who actually spoke. Well, Mitt Ginsburg's now considered worldwide as a poet and such, but he was just a guy living across the street. And then he had this crummy little rock band called the Grateful Dead that, uh, that ended up playing for it. So his, his little opening house for North Face was that. Well, but the company he's better known for, which he, grow, which he did grow into a billion dollar company, and actually his wife was the, was the primary initiator of it, is called Esprit. Um, which I'm sure you, you've heard of in the, in the fabric industry. And so he and his wife grew a spree into a billion dollar entity. That's what he was asked about. And they, that started by his wife making dresses for young women that they could afford on her kitchen table. And, and I don't know, I don't know the history of the fiber types and such. I'm sure she bought fabrics for wherever she could get them. but. Um, but he's now said recently that he would do things differently. The reason that he's profiled in this book is that he has saved almost half of Chile, the country of Chile from deforestation, just, just terrible things. And he actually is the largest landowner other than the government now in Chile, and he's doing some pretty amazing things related to that. So just a little story, and it's in the fiber area. So, you know, you talk about sustainability and, and economic, it is possible to change an industry, literally, and think about things in a sustainable sort of way. Yes. Um, so, great definition of sustainability. So now let's stay on that tack. If, is there a person in the sustainability or green movement um, that has had a really big impact on your life that you could that you could tell our audience about? I know. I wish I hadn't, but it would be Rebecca Burgess. This founder of Fibershed. Um, I'm really I'm really just kind of amazed at how much she has been able to get going on this movement. And when you use the word Fibershed now, even when I'm just out in the world talking about it, people have heard about it, they've read about it, um, and that's really kind of been her, her mission. Um, so yeah. Is she available? In other words, are you able to communicate with her, and have you met her and such? And I do. I have communicated with her. She is available, and she has, um, a, I guess you call an assistant, that whenever I have a question, they've been great at mentoring, and whenever I have a question or anything, somebody who wants to get more information from them, they're, they respond immediately. They're very, yes, they're definitely. Good, so that's great. Um, yeah. 
I think availability in the early stages of a movement is really important for the for the founder in which he is here. Mm -hmm. So, um, sort of, people love stories. Our audience loves stories. And can you give us any story or stories about your experiences? Let's just broadly, not just say the fiber shed. Let's just say it in the in the garment fabric business side of things. Just a funny story or uh, just anything that that just hits your head is that something might people enjoy to, to listen to. Oh, <laughs> like a funny it's story. Not an easy question, I know. So don't if you don't have one, just say so. It's no big deal. Um, I know. I'm trying to think of a funny story. Um, I well, I I had lots of funny moments. I worked in a production knitting uh, factory for a while, and that was funny in ways that when you sit at a machine and knit for eight nine hours a day, you end up entertaining your the other people doing it um, through funny stories and. You know, you find ways to entertain yourself, and um, I ended up having lots of fun with the people while you do those kinds of tasks. <laughs> so I'll prompt you a little bit. Is there yeah. a story you can think of from that experience, just that you can just still remember, real quickly? Just one of the stories yeah. that you either told or you heard being told. That's not private, obviously, that you would share. I know. I'm like, I can't think of anything. Is is there? Would you guys sing to each other, or would you tell about talk about your families? I'm trying to prompt you to think to think of. Yeah, something. a little bit. We talk about families and things that happened. Um, there was there was we did a lot of custom work, and so the clients that would come in for the custom work would often be um, very had lots of great characteristics that we could. <laughs> So did you did you emulate those later after they left and, and everybody would know oh, she's doing something like that person whatever. A little bit, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you know what I don't have any idea what it means. I think I have even a picture in my head of of a fairly assembly sort of what does a custom knitting location look like? You have machines that are all over and how close are you sitting to someone you're working you know near and so on. Um, and this one was pretty small. It, um, did kind of high-end cashmere um, production, and so yeah, we would have um, knitting machines, but they were still hand manipulated, so they're still considered hand knitting. And um, there was this really industrial um, linker that links all the, you know, so you had some of those machines in there, and it was a big room, and you were within, you know arm's length of each other a lot, <laughs> knitting and doing the various parts of production. And, and you say it was small. How many people then would be in that room? Uh, on like a busy day where everyone was there because it kind of, there would be about seven. Okay. Seven of us producing all her sweaters in. And, th and those sweaters were being sold regionally, locally, nationally? What was the market for that? Uh, I think mostly nationally. I mean, I think it started regionally and then nationally, and I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure if there was an international market or not. So here's a tough one sometimes. Maybe we'll see. And again, you don't have to be specific. But can you think of a negative experience? in your life that happened that at the time just seemed really bad, that now you can look back on it and say, you know, that wasn't not only wasn't not so bad, but it actually has helped me be a better person today. And again, okay. talk generically or however it, however it fits. Yeah. Uh, I decided to get go back and pursue a second degree in apparel design. And I think when I did that, because I was older, I had um, kind of a very clear vision of what that would look like when I got out. And when I finished the program and got out and started, you know, applying it to what I was going to do, um, I spent a few years feeling really lost and couldn't really figure out where I fit. And I did some temp work at companies, and I do this. I did tons of interviews. Um, and there was something about those few years I kind of lost my vision a little bit. Um, 
and through, I think at the time, I felt like I was just wandering around and wasn't sure where I was going to land, and I had a lot of stress about it. Um, I ended up researching things like fiber shit and kind of pushing my own craft a little bit, and I think now the stuff I'm pursuing is what I feel passionate about. But it took a few years of kind of, you know, feeling kind, so of, kind of Yeah, feeling lost for a while actually led you to where now you feel like you are where you want to be. Yes, and then I understand why all the other stuff didn't work out now. <laughs> At the time, I didn't understand it, but now I understand. It makes sense. So I'm going to play on Brian here. I, he might have a picture of some sheep up here, and and if he doesn't, he can pull it up, that are look like they're probably in eastern, maybe eastern Oregon. Um, maybe not. Maybe he just pulled this from somewhere. Do you know this picture? Look at the yeah. screen. You'll probably see it there, too. This is a farm we visited, Cook Creek Sheep Company. And they're in Ellensburg, Washington. Uh -huh. um, and they raise a diverse group of sheep. They have some Texel sheep, they have Coopworth, um, and they have been doing it for a while, since about 2002. And they, within the last few years, started to get really into, they were breeding stock. That was mostly what they were doing. They got really interested in the fiber part of it. And now they've been really, um, like the animals are wearing coats, that's to protect the fur, and right. um, yeah. And obviously they don't just shear at once. I'm kind of looking over at Deb here. They must shear through a variety of times during the year because there are shorn animals here that look like they were shorn fairly recently, and then there's ones that have the coats on that are that clearly are going to be shorn sometime in the near future. Yeah, and it depends on the breed, but from what I've been hearing from farmers, um, some are only shorn once a year, and some other breeds, like Icelandic, they shear about two times a year, um, just because their hair gets longer, um, the fibers are longer, but yeah. So here's another one related to something that's happened in the past. A key skill, something you've learned in the recent past that's influencing sort of how you work in your business right now, day to day, that you could share with our audience so that maybe they could take advantage of learning from the same thing, you know, whatever, whether it's a tool of some kind, um, it's something on the internet, you name it, a book, anything. What's, what's a skill you've learned? In the um, I think I've really had to focus on my self-discipline and kind of um, when you don't have uh, like when you don't have a set schedule I don't have a set schedule I don't have to show up at 8 anywhere I don't it's you have to be really self-disciplined to get up and keep in motion and keep you know um, so kind of the work ethic and the self-discipline being really organized and organizing your time because Often I'm doing many projects. It's not just one task. I have multiple projects. So I would say kind of self being self-disciplined about it and organizing. Right. Do you have any any things any things you've done to help you with that? Either book you've read, do you use a planner of some kind, do you use something online? Obviously we're doing this over a computer. We're sitting thousands of miles apart and talking. Is there any, any given tool or tools that you're using that help you with that? I use like an old school planner. <laughs> I have to write everything down. I, I can't remember things on, like if I put it in a computer or on that, I don't, so I'm a big writer. I'm writing on sticky notes and writing. Whenever I think of something that has to be done, I'm writing it down. I have a planner and, you know, a lot of writing and putting it in front of me seems to definitely help. So this is not one of the questions, but you talked about art earlier and clearly designing fabrics and, and then designing clothing is art. Um, mm -hmm. I see a guitar in the background. Um, is that you or you're, uh, someone else in the family? It's, it's others in the family. Okay. Um, do you, how about yourself as an artist? Um, clearly, if you enjoy knitting and such, that's an art. What, what other kinds of art forms do you like? and what? What would you say about yourself as an artist that you really enjoy? Um, I love 
more sculptural things. I think that's why I love clothing and textiles. I like to get my hands on it. Um, I love felting, like wet felting. I'm felting a giant costume for a music video for a band right now. So I like doing kind of collaborative, uh, creative projects. But I'm definitely a hand worker. I like creating things with my hands, and which often ends up being fiber related. But um, yeah, I like uh, more, more of a sculptor. Awesome. Yeah. Um, is there anything that's in the room there that you did? Uh, there's a painting back there. You probably didn't no, do that. No, not in this room. Nope. <laughs> um, sometimes in, when we're doing these, people have got stuff that's behind them and so on. Um, so I asked about this earlier. I just I referred to it. Is there a book that you've read recently that's somehow influencing you today, whether it's life or in business or broadly? Yeah, there's a few books. Um, one that kind of helped snap me out of my funk when I was bouncing around Moss for a few years was You Are a Badass. I see that. We've got it on the picture here. Um, it's basically just kind of it helps you get your brain looking at things a little differently <laughs> and gives you some confidence and ways in looking at, you know, sometimes your views of things get a little skewed. And then another book I read um, was Quiet um, by Susan Cain, and it's about the power of introverts in a world that can't stop talking. And that was huge for me because I've always, um, I think I'm more, I'm definitely more an introvert and things out there and ideas and movements and um, it had a lot of great kind of ways for introverts to maneuver what's becoming a very extrovert world. So those two. Yeah, that's an interesting one. I got to expand on that one a little. Um, so do you you really believe that? You think the world is becoming more broadly more um, Kind to extroverts? Is that is that what you mean by that? Or ex explain or that a little. More, um, there's a there's a lot of now. It requires a lot of self promotion. You know, we have all the social media and everything's online. And I think there's a lot of like for me, if I didn't go on the have a Facebook account and do a web page and did none of that and stayed really introvert and just created my craft and put it out, it's hard to compete. It's hard to, you know, and so I think a lot of the self-promotion part of being, like people who are extroverted, it's much easier for them to self-promote their work and put their stuff out there and um, that's always an uncomfortable place for me. Um, I'm happier creating it and then, you know, I'd like to just hand it off. So somebody, so somebody but in just fact, you know, you do it all now. You you sell yeah. from a cell. You make it. You you know. Somebody who's just meeting you, literally, as we talk to each other, you know, across the computer screen, would not say you're introverted. So you're doing a great job of of uh, pulling at because usually the people who are just totally introverted would never agree to do this. <laughs> so yeah. Uh, I actually do have a question here, and and this is from Mark. He says, when you are in trouble. Who is the first person that you that um, that pops up into your head to help you? Uh, my partner, John. Right. Yeah, that would be the first person I would go to. Awesome. That's the one. That's a surprise. That one I didn't make. That one. That one came from one of our customers. <laughs> um, is there a quote from someone who's famous, and that's your definition of famous, that you can? remember that you think our audience should hear because it's memorable to you, because it sticks in your head. Yeah, it's um, it's a chief Seattle quote. Um, it's, Humankind has not woven the web of life. We are but one thread within it. Whatever we do to the web, we do to ourselves. All things are bound together. All things connect. Wow, that's pretty cool. Would you say that one again? Just because just, I think yeah. that's, it's long enough that, that people should hear it a couple times. So why don't, you, why don't you just say that one more time? Okay. Humankind has not woven the web of life. 
We are but one thread within it. Whatever we do to the web, we do to ourselves. All things are bound together. All things connect. Very cool. And where did you say you said that came from? Uh, Seattle? Seattle, yeah, in 1854. Wow. Yeah. Very neat. Um, well, that actually brings us to the last of the questions that I had that's just sort of um, broadly about you. And then I want to come back and we'll finish up talking about the fiber shed a little bit more. Um, and let's pretend that today, and this is taken from a guy that I know named John Lee Dumas who does an amazing podcast um, called Entrepreneur on Fire. He always asks this of his guests for the last question. So I'm going to do the same thing. Let's pretend you woke up tomorrow morning and after a couple hours of sort of figuring this out, you realize you weren't on earth, you were not anywhere near home, but wherever you were at, it was a friendly place. Uh, you seemed to have a place to live. You even had met some people. They spoke the same language and such. Um, but it just it wasn't home. You were you were clearly somehow teletransported somewhere else. And you found that you had a laptop. So we're talking probably across the laptop now. Um, and five hundred dollars. And, and five hundred as if it was today's money and today. And and that's all that's what you had. You knew your daily needs were sort of taken care of. Those people that you found yourself with said, hey, you know, you just showed up, but we'll take care of you, whatever. What would you do for the next seven days with a laptop and $500 and clothes on your back? I would try to find a way to travel and to check out this new place. Okay. Um, yeah, whether I was researching or buying fare to get, but I would. My whole thing would I want to see where I'm at. I would like to check it out. So you'd figure out how to get out and around and see what's around yes. you. Yep, okay. definitely. Well, that's all the prepared questions that I had. So like I said, I want to end up going back to the fiber shed. So um, we're, we've got probably about, oh, we got a little bit of time, six, seven minutes here. A couple other just questions that I had um, and others on our audience. If you got specific questions of fiber shed, throw it in here for, uh, for, for Shannon. Um, What's your goals with the fiber shed over the next year and the next five years, let's say? Uh, the next year is building the community um, through uh, these producer stories that we've been doing and getting out and actually giving a face to all the people that are doing and what they're doing in our community, um, as well as hopefully starting events like uh, classes, workshops, uh, public education, um, and we're also trying to get a marketplace going where people who, there's been a lot of people who have a barn full of fiber and they don't know what to do with it and help people connect with others. Um, in five years, um, I, would, I think the goal would definitely be to have a, a mill that could produce then answer the needs of what's being grown regionally. Um, and I think through what we'll be doing for the next year, um, we'll know more about what that looks like, um, what people are needing, wanting, um, and how much fiber we have. All that has to be kind of researched and figured out. If I'm watching this, and you just got me incredibly excited today about the fiber shed concept. And I'm in the Portland area. I'm in the, that 150 mile radius. What can I do to help you? Um, at this point, <laughs> ways to help. Um, as we start doing and getting out more, um, there's going to be lots of opportunities for um, as we do events, you know, there'll be ways to help there. Um, and I think if someone's interested and excited about it, what I always say is jump on the website, send us your info, and then we'll talk. You know, and, and some of the ways that we've helped, we've done videos for some of the farms to help them get their, you know, product out there and what they're doing out there. Um, some people really want to help um, kind of on the ground level, and I think over the next year we'll be building. I can't personally do it all, <laughs> so there will be opportunities to start helping as it starts growing. 
definitely. So you said something that this is me now as the selfish alpaca breeder. So I have a lot of alpacas, a couple hundred, and, and we're, we'd be considered a fairly large herd. Mm -hmm. And we hear it from our friends and, and colleagues in the in the alpaca industry all the time, which is we've got all this fleece and we just don't know what to do with it. And so it's stored here and stored there. Is that the case with other fiber animal breeders? Because I think we in the alpaca industry, we get a little bit inside ourselves, but are there sheep breeders and, and goat breeders and rabbit breeders and others that have got fiber sitting around that they really would wish they could get handled and aren't able to? Yeah, and, I've, and I'm constantly surprised. I get a lot of uh, emails from farms that have that exact question. Like, we have a barn filled with wool. And I think that's a big thing, too, is the research part of this is, what, you know, fiber, the way it's produced, what fiber can be, you know, um, trying to find a way to use all this fiber. <laughs> you know, there's, yeah. By the way, make sure to stay connected with me after this or with my wife, who's obviously really interested in this from a day-to-day -day perspective, and I'm looking at her as I'm saying this, too, to get a name from us and get a contact for Peter Lavote. So spelled L-A-V-A-U-T-E. His wife is the chairperson, the chairwoman of the Fiber Arts College at a university in, in Missouri. And I notice I'm not saying the University of because I know it's not the main campus, okay. but it's something like Southwestern State, something like that. But anyway, it, it, she would be a really good person for you to at least know of, and so. We'll make sure to get your contact. I just don't. I don't have it right now. But yeah, that'd that be would. Because research is clearly um, that's what she does a lot of, and she goes around mm -hmm. the world even and talks about it. Um, so um, I don't have any other specific questions. I don't see from our audience. Well, let, let's end it with this. Would you just sort of finalize and say anything you'd like to say about um, about your, the fiber shed, about you know anything? You just you just ended up here for us. Okay. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna end it up with talking about something else, but but about the, the the presentation, just talk about anything that you would you would like to. I I think this would be um, there's just the passion comes from knowing there's a better way than the way we're producing garments now, and I think I spent enough time in the industry and been in enough different parts of it um, to want to find the better way and work with the community. I think the community is wanting it as well. I think we all want, we know there's a better way of doing the process, so. Well, that's a great way to end then on find a better way. So I'm going to throw out to our audience. You can think of ways you can help Shannon find a better way for the entire fiber um, process. Go to the Pacific Northwest Fiber Shed website, make a comment, send a contact. I'm sure that she'd be welcome to uh, to get that and would probably respond to you. And um, Jan, this has been awesome. Um, I know from just watching the people in the room here with me that they've enjoyed it and those online I'm sure have. We get a lot more people that listen to this as a replay. So over time, more and more will listen. We wish you the best of luck with what you're doing. Um, hopefully, even as we're in Portland sometime, maybe we can come visit and say hi to you. And you're certainly welcome to do that here. As you know, somebody you know is is one of our one of our staff, and so we'd love to have you come out and visit us. And um, I'm sure there's people in our audience with, that would feel the same way. So thank you so much. It's been fun, and I wish you'd send some of our warm weather, your warm weather, our way. Okay. Yeah, we can give you some rain. Yeah. So. We'll send our rain your way. You send your sunshine. Um, everybody, remember, in two weeks, we'll be here the same time, same station. Um, I, right now, can't remember who our speaker's going to be. Is, uh, can, her name is Sarah. And what does she do? Oh, it's our chicken farmer. Oh, we have a chicken farmer named Sarah. And Sarah is going to talk about our chicken farm. So oh, that will be very cool. Um, so in two weeks, come and listen to Sarah Meyer talk about growing lots of chickens, but I mean lots, like 750 of them from having none three months ago. So 
um, how can you be a new chicken farmer and have lots of them and do it commercially? So Sarah's got a great story, and Shannon obviously had a wonderful story for us. Shannon, thank you so much. Thank you, everybody in the audience, and we'll be back with you in a couple weeks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.